Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Steve Clemens, and I have founded the American Strategy Program and uh, help run the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation. I write the blog, uh, the Washington Note, as many of you know, but many of you may not know uh, that I am an editor at large at Talking Points Memo and have a long and deep uh, partnership with uh, Josh Marshall. And uh, Josh and TPM have uh, a fantastic um, roundtable series. I'm going to ask Josh to say a few words, and we're going to quickly go around the room and say hello, and then we're going to ask Anne-Marie uh, to offer some provocations this morning on her view of America's, uh, the terms of America's engagement with the rest of the world and how that ought to be structured. Uh, so Josh, Josh Marshall. Thanks, Steve. Um, well, uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I, my name is Josh Marshall. I'm the uh, editor and publisher of Talking Points Memo. Um, a national news and politics website. We're actually headquartered in New York, and we have a bureau in uh, Washington, D.C. Our uh, Washington bureau chief, David Kurtz, is here uh, at the end of the table. Um, this is the third in our TPM Newsmaker series. We had our first one with uh, Dennis McDonough and Ben Rhodes, I think about six months ago, and then uh, the second in our series uh, last month with uh, Evo Dalder. And this, we'll be doing these uh, monthly, in most cases, around breakfast, like, like, like this one is. We'll also be doing some at different times of the day, depending on, depending on the speaker and the context and so forth. And then we're going to begin with um, some half-day panel events in the second half of the uh, second half of, of 2011. And uh, as Steve said, Steve joined us as uh, editor-at-large. Um, about three months ago, and we'll be, in addition to working with our, um, our editors and reporters on, on the editorial side, his main role will be as a uh, curator and, and impresario um, with an expanding portfolio with our event series going forward. So uh, with that, I'm going to give it back to Steve to introduce our guest and uh, get the conversation going. Great. Thank you, Josh. So we've introduced Josh. Let's very quickly go around. James, would you just do name, rank, and serial number? Cynthia Tucker, Atlanta Journal Constitution. Michelle Jermisco, Bloomer. John Tolleson, State Department. Use your lungs. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Will Thomas, Center for Global Conflict. Dan Dumby, Financial Times. Wendy Chamberlain, Middle East Institute. Matt Dust, Center for American Progress. Matthew Iglesias, Center for American Progress. Luis Vesti, French Embassy. Hamburg Stresser, State Department. Jordan Donato, I work here for Steve. David Kurtz with TPM. Jonathan Geyer, at New America Foundation. <coughs> Will Garchor, World Wildlife Fund. Henry Farrell, George Washington University, and uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. Dominic Chilcott, British Embassy. April Mascara, Enterprise Service. Kay King, Council on Foreign Relations. Samir Lawani, MIT. Elise Labitt, CNN. Kent Hughes, Woodrow Wilson Center. Alan Platt, Gibson Dunn, Crutcher. Honor to Bograv, CSIS. Mary Beth Sheridan, Washington Post. Josh Rogan, Foreign Policy Magazine. And I'm Steve Clements. Let me tell you a little bit about Anne Marie Slaughter. Uh, I've been getting in the habit, uh, and when I write about Anne Marie, of just going for shorthand and calling her Madam X. And, and of course, she holds the job in the State Department and in the U.S. government, one of the few jobs that I think are the very best to have. Uh, there is, I think, as the world becomes more and more complex and things speed up, it's very difficult, as a friend of mine uh, uh, said, who uh, senior in the National Security, it's very difficult to find time to think. And the way in which strategic discussions and uh, the terms of America's engagement in the world are sort of thought about uh, tends to be as much about a reaction to things that are happening as uh, stepping back and asking, uh, really, where should we be going? Where should America put its bets? How should we begin thinking about uh, the terms of our engagement? So Madam X here uh, is a very avant-garde uh, thinker for a long time. What is not in her official bio is she is actually was a very active blogger, and I hope she'll get back to it. She ran on Talking Points Memo a whole stable of some of the most thoughtful and important thinkers in foreign policy called America Abroad. Jim Steinberg was one of those. Evo Dalder was another of those. And as we launched this roundtable series, I thought it was appropriate to try and go and get uh, some of those folks who've entered government who were the big thinkers who came in to, to, to think about this. Of course, she is uh, the director of the Office of um, Policy Planning at the Department of State. Previous to that, she was dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of, Pu Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs uh, at Princeton University, where she's returning. I don't know why she's giving up the world's best job here to go back, but uh, maybe we'll learn That's a little bit more. I, I know. <laughs> I do know the answer. Um, 
Before she was a professor at Harvard uh, Law School, uh, the author of the book, uh, The Idea That Is America Keeping Faith With Our Values in a Dangerous World. Um, and she also, uh, with John Eikenberry, ran the Princeton Project on National Security, um, titled Forging a World of Liberty Under Law. And the New America Foundation, an American strategy program, was very privileged to help uh, be part of the launch process of that paper. And I remember very well when Joe Biden and Chuck Hagel and others came out uh, and wrestled with some of the ideas that she put on the table. And as many of you know, I tend to come at these issues um, from less a position of international law and international institutions and more from a cynical Nixonian realist perspective. And I so regularly find myself at this point in agreement with um, Anne Marie that it shows, I think, really, if you're, you're a vigorous, rigorous thinker about what's going on, you realize we have a lot of problems, that the world has changed so dramatically, uh, and the neatness of the past doesn't quite work. So you've got to figure out how, when we were um, during the uh, Washington uh, Ideas Festival, sponsored by the Aspen Institute, the Museum, and the Atlantic Monthly, we were in a discussion with Jane, um, um, I was going to say Jane Harman. Hampshire, Jane Harmon. Not Jane Hampshire, sorry, Jane Hampshire, and hello, Jane Harmon. Uh, on, on not the rule of law abroad, but the fog of law, and thinking about how do you create out of the various gray zones we have in the world, begin moving America more into this. And Anne Marie has been the Sherpa, the director, the diva of the uh, QDDR process, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review process um, there, and has, has brought that to um, uh, close and issuing a final report and has really done, you know, I was a skeptic of this process. She called me one day, wasn't real thrilled about something I wrote about the QDDR process. Then she called me back the next day, thank you for writing about it, because now people really care. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I've seen her arm twist and wrestle other institutions of government than at state to cooperate and think in bigger ways than just their own institution about how to do it. And I want to pay tribute to that right now. But without further ado, let me ask uh, Anne-Marie to offer provocations this morning, and then we'll open, you know, a kind of breakfast roundtable discussion. So, Anne-Marie, Perfect. You. Steve, I think you give the best introduction in Washington. I think I should just stop now, <laughs> go back to Princeton, and feel really great. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted to see all of you, and particularly on a horrible morning outside. Uh, it, it feels nice to be inside and have a chance to have a discussion with uh, a wonderful range of people. And I have to say, after two years, I'm delighted that I know many of you uh, and have engaged with many of you, and, and that's really one of the great pleasures of being in Washington. I, th I think what you really probably came here this morning for is for a dramatic reading of the QDDR. It's only 150 pages, and I, I thought I would just start at the beginning and we'd see how far we go. The longer <laughs> telegram. The longer the telegram. The longer telegram, <laughs> 150 page. Um, uh, quite seriously, uh, I'm not going to give my standard presentation on the QDDR. As Steve said, I'd like to talk about six ways in which I think American engagement with the world ought to be structured based on the ideas of the QDDR. I think that's exactly the right way to look at it. I will start by saying that the QDDR is an important document both strategically because it asks us to step back, look at the major trends in the world, look at the national security strategy and the, national pre and the presidential decision directive on development, and then ask ourselves, all right, what capabilities do we need to actually implement those priorities? Pretty straightforward mode of thinking, but not one that the State Department uh, or USAID have been known for. Uh, and it, we will be asking Congress to require us to do this every four years so, so that we have the discipline of holding ourselves accountable in four years as to how well we did on what we recommended now, and then we go forward. There's also a very important political dimension to that. Secretary Clinton sat on the Armed Services Committee. She watched the Department of Defense come in with its budget and justify its budget based on the QDR and then, of course, the national military strategy and all the planning that follows from that. We are in a time when we have to justify pretty much every penny we spend uh, to Congress, to the taxpayers, and this is the kind of document that allows us to begin doing that at the macro level, and then that gives rise to annual statements of priority from the top floor down out to the missions, a planning process that then informs the budget. Again, pretty straightforward, uh, but it is really a different way of doing business going forward, and as I said, it's, it's really important politically as well as strategically. So six ways that we ought to be engaging the world going forward. The first is through civilian power. 
that QDDR is called Leading Through Civilian Power. The premise is that in the 21st century, the first face of American power has to be civilian. It has to be our diplomats, our development experts, our civilian experts across the government. Civilian power is, of course, supported closely by military power and often partners with military power. So this is not a civilian power versus military power. I've just been in Europe uh, and talking to many different audiences, and that's immediately how people want to interpret it, that it's somehow civilian versus military. Not at all. The strongest supporters of this approach are Secretary Gates and Chairman Mullen. Uh, and General Petraeus, Admiral Stavridis, they are all on record supporting this approach. And indeed, Secretary Gates was out front calling for the need to build up our civilian power and put that face first. So that is the starting point uh, of the QDDR. So the second thing to say is as we engage through civilian power, that doesn't just mean the State Department and USAID. I said our diplomats and our development experts, but it goes beyond that to include the civilians who work in every U.S. agency, including DOD, who work across international borders. And that is a lot of agencies. In fact, it's hard to find an agency today that is purely a domestic agency. When uh, the White House convened the Presidential Decision Directive on Development to, develop our, to come up with our new development policy. There were 16 development agencies around the table and 10 more who would have identified themselves that way. If we went uh, and convened a meeting for all the agencies who engage in some kind of diplomacy, certainly the Department of Energy would be there, the Department of Agriculture would be there, the Health and Human Services, DHS, Department of Justice, Treasury, which of course leads in economic diplomacy, uh, the SEC, all the economic uh, agencies. And in coming to the conclusion of the QDDR, all those agencies had comments that we took account of in three different rounds because all of them are engaged abroad. And the proposition of the QDDR <coughs> is that if we think about civilian power, we actually have to embrace that. It's a good thing that Health and Human Services and the Center for Disease Control are engaging with their counterparts abroad. If we had a global epidemic as important as the State Department and USAID are, you certainly want uh, our health, our health uh, agencies to be actively engaged. Same thing if you're talking about building the rule of law abroad. Of course it's important for us to be there, but you wouldn't want to not have the Department of Justice who know the most about prosecutions building the rule of law. So it's a it's a much broader concept of what civilian power is. It involves essentially a, a bargain between uh, US uh, AID state and the other agencies where we, we welcome and embrace what they're doing on the ground and indeed in Washington with their various programs. They agree that they're going to work within a broad strategic framework that is led by state on the uh, on the diplomatic side, and USAID is the lead development agency on the development side. Now, you might be saying that's what the NSC does. Absolutely, that's what the NSC does in countless instances that rise to presidential attention. And there we're all around the table and we all work within an interagency framework led by the NSC. So if we're talking about our policy toward Iran or Afghanistan or Somalia, we're going to be at the White House. But there are 190 countries <laughs> And there are a vast range of issues on which the NSC cannot possibly engage day to day. And the question then is who convenes the meetings? Who gets people together? Who develops the plan that everybody works within? Because you've got, you know, you've got labor programs and justice programs and agriculture programs. That's a lot of resources. It's a lot of talent. And if you can bring it together, you've got a much greater civilian power than we have had. So that's the, the second point is the definition of civilian power. And I'll just say this is an issue around the world. I do not know a single foreign ministry who has not observed the rise in every other agency working abroad. That's a function of globalization. And then ask themselves, well, A, what does that mean for our role and how do we actually bring that together? So in many ways, the United States is answering that question. We're out front at answering that question and there's going to be a lot of interest in other countries. Third way to engage regionally and multilaterally. 
Uh, and this, if you look at our policy over the past two years, it's very evident. What have we been doing uh, in Asia, for instance? We've been working very hard uh, to, first of all, to re-engage with ASEAN uh, and indeed with Northeast Asia as well, then to join the East Asian Summit uh, to really develop an institution in Asia that can engage on all economic and security uh, issues together. That's one instance of a larger perception that in a world of over 190 countries in which they're constantly shifting alliances, this is not a world of block voting anymore. We can do a lot bilaterally, but honestly, for a lot of the, the problems we face to get the kind of cooperation we need, we have to be working through regional and multilateral organizations. So the third emphasis in the QDDR is how to build up our capability to act regionally, to think regionally, and multilaterally, and how to connect what we do regionally and multilaterally better to our bilateral embassies. That has uh, some very practical implications. We've introduced the idea of regional circuit riders. You can tell that it was a lawyer uh, who uh, <laughs> had a role here, but we actually have circuit riders within countries. These will be uh, foreign service officers who are specialized in multilateral diplomacy or women's issues or environmental issues and any number of the functional expertises that we develop who will be based at a regional hub and who will travel around the embassies of the region. Uh, that allows them to see the region as a whole, to cross-fertilize, and gives us a greater regional capability. It also means working more closely with the COCOMs. Uh, and I was just in Stuttgart talking to both UCOM and AFRICOM. We, they both have civilian deputies in addition to their foreign policy advisor. Uh, they have people from other agencies as well. We're going to have to develop a greater civilian capability to engage alongside uh, our military in the regional uh, combatant commands. Fourth uh, way uh, that we want to engage uh, the world sounds internal and bureaucratic, and it's a, a standard, no, yeah, it is, okay, fair point, it is internal and bureaucratic, but what I was going to say is, for all the dismissal of moving the boxes on the org chart, my observation of Washington bureaucracy is that makes an awful lot of difference. That's who sits at the table, how they formulate issues, where our resources go. So uh, you're, we're in a bureau, uh, town of bureaucracies. In a bureaucracy, how you shift those boxes really matters. And we are shifting the organization of the State Department in ways that really mean we're going to be engaging the world Still, of course, regionally, we still have our regional bureaus, but on the functional side in quite different ways, in three broad ways. One, international security and arms control. We've always had that bureau uh, undersecretary. That undersecretary continues. We've asked for a new Bureau of Counterterrorism. It is possible the Bureau of Counterterrorism will be a uh, part of that undersecretary's uh, domain. Not clear. That's one of the questions to be worked out, but quite possible. But international security and arms control, one. Two, global systems. Uh, so we're thinking we, the new undersecretary for economics, for energy resources, and for the environment. Right now, we have an undersecretary for global affairs who does not have the environment uh, within her domain, nor energy. And yet, if you're really thinking about global affairs, you really should start. Uh, with, the, with the economy. So now there is an undersecretary who will have all economic affairs, energy resources, the environment that includes science and the uh, science and technology advisor. That also means we see that trade-offs need to be made in those areas to really get sustainable economic growth. Uh, it has to take account, obviously, of the environment and of energy resources. So that's the second way. The third way is much newer and extremely important for the challenges we face. We are organizing ourselves around human security, around all the issues that affect individuals on the ground. So we have international security, state to state, still hugely important, but we will now have an undersecretary for civilian security, democracy, and human rights. And under that undersecretary will be a new Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, the bureau that will be overseeing getting civilians on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, but as I'll say in a moment, equally importantly, getting teams on the ground in Sudan, Sudan or Yemen or Tajikistan uh, or Kyrgyzstan, states where we need to be before conflict breaks out. So that new bureau, next to the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement uh, Bureau, 
which really looks at a lot of these same issues, but when the violence is coming from global criminal networks rather than insurgencies. Same idea often of having to build security and justice sector reform, rule of law, accountable institutions. Those two bureaus are together. The third one is democracy, rights, and labor, which again, you're talking about building the rule of law, you're talking about democracy, you're talking about human rights, you're talking about how you protect individuals through law. Tremendous synergies that we never have put together before or organized ourselves to think about. And finally, population, refugees, and migration, humanitarian diplomacy. When there are crises, you meet the basic needs of individuals across the board. If you look at the world going forward and you look at we have all the big issues still of interstate conflict, nuclear proliferation, uh, the regional conflicts, rising powers, all of those issues are still dealt with by the regional bureaus and by arms control and international security. But just look at the headlines. Just look at the headlines right now. You're looking at Sudan. You're looking at how we actually build Iraq on the civilian side. We're looking at how we move from conflict or even in conflict in Afghanistan to governance, to get governments that provide basic services. We're looking at Mexico and Guatemala and s states that are really challenged by global crime. We have to have a set of bureaus to be able to address those issues together with USAID uh, and with, with uh, the DOD and other agencies. Many other governments around the world have already seen this dimension of international security or global security. We, I think, are going to now be a leader in the way that we're organizing ourselves to address it. So that's the fourth way. The fifth way, which is not, it's, it's one that runs all the way through, is through development. Right? The Secretary Clinton started her tenure by talking about smart power, by talking about development and diplomacy uh, as equal pillars of American foreign policy alongside defense. And she started the QDDR, first of all, by saying it needs to be a review of d diplomacy and development, which was new, and saying development has to be elevated. We have to think of development not as something that you do over here and you do foreign policy through diplomacy over here, but that the problems we face in foreign policy, the long-term solutions, and often the intermediate solutions, are through development as much as diplomacy. So again, think of the broad issues we face, countering violent extremism or terrorism, health of the global economy, climate change, global pandemics, energy security, resource scarcity. Those are all issues that have to be addressed from the bottom up. They, they start on the ground in terms of the conditions of people's lives, uh, the state of their health systems, their ability uh, to uh, actually survive without destroying forests uh, or otherwise contributing uh, to global warming. So development is a critical part of how we think about foreign policy issues. And that's a critical part of how we engage the world. In practical terms, that meant building up USAID in all sorts of ways, uh, and we've done that from giving them back a policy planning and learning budget. And I have to just say, in the two years I've been here, I was just at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, with Jose Fernandez, our Assistant Secretary for Economics and Business Affairs, and Michael Kramer, who's the new head of Development Innovation Ventures at USAID. Michael Kramer is one of the best development thinkers in the world. He is an incredibly innovative economist from Harvard, and he's the new face of USAID. No longer am I going to hear from uh, foundation executives telling me that they fly to London to talk to DFID, but they don't fly to Washington to talk to USAID. They'll be flying to Washington to hear what we're doing in uh, at the f cutting edge of development practice. So building USAID, giving it control again of major presidential initiatives like the Food Security Initiative, and over time, uh, assuming they meet certain benchmarks, the Global Health Initiative, really uh, giving them the people, the flexibility to be the kind of cutting edge development agency they need to be. And finally, engaging the world not through conflict, but conflict prevention. Uh, we were asked to develop a civilian capability to respond to conflict and crises that would be skilled, knowledgeable, and quick. Now, obviously, when we came in, Deputy Secretary Jack Lew was asked to put 1,000 people on the ground uh, in Afghanistan. We had a coordinator for stabilization and reconstruction who had been working for the better part of a decade but had never been funded properly or organized in a way that they were deeply connected to the other bureaus in state, and they couldn't take on this task. 
we actually decided to step back. And instead of starting to talk by stabilization and reconstruction, which is what you do when you've got troops in the field and you need to move from conflict to recovery to development, the State Department, from a civilian power perspective, starts with prevention. You don't want to get to the point where you've got troops in the field. You want to do what we're doing in Sudan or Yemen now. And it doesn't guarantee that conflict won't break out, but we actually know quite a lot about conflict prevention. It's always the dog that doesn't bark because you can't see the conflicts that didn't break out, and we have some good examples. Uh, if you, the one that is always cited is Macedonia at the end of the, the former Yugoslavia, but there are many cases in which individual diplomats on the ground know that by timely intervention we actually succeeded. It can't just be diplomacy, though. It's got to be development. It's got to be teams of election monitors, community reconciliation teams, uh, groups that do a particular kind of development that helps stabilize early on with early warning systems, a whole body of knowledge that is developing around conflict prevention and response within fragile states. So we're creating at the State Department a Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations which will be, is, which is designed to, to fit into a global network of those bureaus. Britain has the, uh, how do you know, am I, am, I, am I talking more slowly? Did I slow down? I need to speed up. Anticipating. <laughs> um, so, uh, Britain has a Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, the Netherlands, Canada, a number, and of course the UN, uh, regional organizations, we're creating this bureau in a way that will fit with a larger global network. We'll have to do that. We don't have the resources to be able to take these issues on alone. But it'll also be a, a, a bureau where we collect the knowledge and that we expect any foreign service officer coming in today to, ex to know that part of his or her career will be spent in a fragile state. Uh, they will have to have this kind of knowledge and they'll be linked up uh, to that bureau. That bureau, in turn, is the partner for DOD and USAID and the other bureaus who work in this area. So that's six different ways to engage the world based on the QDDR, through civilian power, uh, a concept of civilian power that is far broader than state and USAID that harnesses all of our federal government, uh, including the civilians in DOD, on the civilian side, uh, re engaging much more through regional and multilateral organizations, engaging from the perspective of state security, human security, and global systems, engaging through development as much as diplomacy, and engaging through conflict prevention. Uh, I think overall this is really recognizing a fundamental turn in the way we think about global problems and the way we are organized to address them. It's a way of thinking not only about states, but about societies, about how those go together. It's a way that says, as I always say, if in the 1980s foreign policy experts had to know about arms control, you didn't have to be an expert, but you had to know about the debates. You had to know the vocabulary. I can still talk about SLBMs and MIRVs and throw weights and all of that stuff, because you had to. Going forward, a serious foreign policy person is going to have to know at least that much about development and conflict prevention. Those are going to be part of the broader strategic foreign policy thinking, and the QDDR is the foundation for the organizational changes, the resource changes, the process changes that we need to make that a reality. Cool. Thanks so much, uh, Anne Marie. I sort of yeah. miss sometimes the MERV world. Um, <laughs> Still MERV. I, I want to open this up. Maybe, maybe I can open up with just a, a little bit of a question. Um, a, as you know, when you launched this, and, and Secretary Clinton was involved um, in, in making the presentation of the QDDR, I, I posed a question to her. And I posed a question that said, that here at the New American Foundation, Tony Zinni, General Zinni, had been dismissive of both the notion of smart power and of USAID's and states' ability to organize themselves in a such a way to be serious about conflict stabilization. And that while he had tried to give it, you know, be open-minded to the notion, he really saw no other way than ba basically taking the civilian command sections out of every uh, combatant command and organizing as its own super command and then situating AID and state people next to them so they could learn how to do the job. Uh, and uh, you may remember Hillary Clinton's response was strong. And she essentially said that the tables are going to turn, that part of this is reasserting the State Department's statutory authority as the lead in all of these issues. And I would have loved to have gone on with her back because it's fascinating and I don't think it really has come out in the press that that's a very bold statement she made and it really runs in a counter direction to what we've seen 
uh, on a de facto basis happening where DOD has been acting as the lead, as the diplomats, as the funders, you know, as the go-to place for other countries. So I wonder if you can share your impressions and thought. And how do you do this with you leaving? Because there's one thing to write a report and get all the kind of elegant design in place, but part of what you had to do was wrestle with other bureaucratic players. D does their commitment to this process hold after you depart? That's, that's a number of questions. Let me start with the, the broader issue of state aid, DOD relations, and then come to why I think I'm, I can leave and not worry uh, that, that this will remain on, on a shelf. So on the, on the first point, there was a vicious circle there where absolutely USAID had lost 40% of its personnel in, since the early 1990s. The State Department was shrinking. They were, certainly shrank during the 1990s. Uh, and in building back up, we were not organizing in these ways to actually be able to engage. So DOD would look and say, you know, we need these functions, but state and USAID aren't there. We'll take it over and then got more funding and we got less funding and it's a vicious circle. Uh, so that the first thing to, to, to have done, which we did do immediately uh, it, when we came in, was to get a major budget increase for state and aid, which will obviously is uh, we're in different budget circumstances now. But even with what we got, and actually even with what we had in 2008, at least for aid, because there was a major increase uh, made, we are able to do a lot more than we were able to do. And we will still be asking for increases in very targeted areas. We also have gotten back some of our authorities uh, from DOD, particularly in strategic communications, uh, and in these areas of, of, of development uh, and, and a sort of non-military, direct military assistance, we've, we're both getting back authority and we're developing pooled funding mechanisms. And honestly, I think going forward, we are going to have to rely much more on that kind of approach. It is very unlikely that we're going to see a huge shift of resources from DOD to state and aid, but it is likely that we are going to find ways to be able to spend those resources together with state and aid in the lead. So then you say, well, now how's that going to happen? And the answer is, what I said before, it's the military who understand in many ways better than anyone that it has to be civilians in the lead, both because we really do have knowledge they need. And they are a learning organization. They have built schools and hospitals and places that haven't worked. And then they've seen what has worked. Uh, we actually in the QDDR have a very, uh, nice box about how state and aid and the Navy have cooperated in Kenya to develop a uh, watch on the water program that really is military resources, but but spent with the kind of expertise that you need to make it sustainable. And those examples are going to replicate because the military understand. Again, I was just talking to UCOM uh, and AFRICOM. They also don't want their soldiers doing the whole spectrum of development activity. That is not what our military are trained to do. Uh, it means that they have an ever-expanding set of missions, and they're going to have face budget constraints as well. So. I really think the stars are aligned for this kind of an approach, and we are getting a lot of support uh, from the military. I don't think that means that you're, they're going to close up shop on the civilian side. We defined, it's defined civilian power across the board, but I do think the arrangements will be quite different. How can this get done if I leave? Well, and Jack Lou left, uh, and we, we, are, we are definitely shifting to the implementation stage. First answer is, it would be crazy for me to try to drive the implementation. Our job was to formulate the report, to work with all the bureaus, to figure out how you could make these recommendations in a way they would work. They weren't done in a vacuum. They were done very actively engaging with people in the building who want to make these changes happen. It would be crazy to do anything else. We've basically empowered a lot of people in the State Department and USAID who want to do this. And in implementation, they are the people who need to make to drive this. They're the people who are going to be doing it. They have to actually implement. Otherwise, it remains way too theoretical. And it needs ownership across both buildings. I mean, we engaged over 500 people in creating this. 
but there are going to be thousands of people involved in implementing it. So Deputy Secretary Nides, as he said it is swearing in yesterday, and as the Secretary said it is swearing in yesterday, is responsible for seeing that this is accountable. If you know anything about Secretary Clinton, you know she finishes what she starts, uh, and she is very committed to this, and he will then oversee a process of implementation where there will be discrete uh, bureaus and people in charge of, of different chunks. And I honestly think that's the role of policy planning is to hand off uh, when we've, d we've done the, the broader plan. Okay, let's go around the room and uh, we'll start. Josh Rogan. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the coming budget battle when we say no battle plan survives first contact <laughs> with the enemy. In this case, the enemy is Congress. And, mm. uh, you you know, said that. I did not. <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the, the yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I've got, we're streaming live. I've got to tell people, so there's a microphone. And, and Jordan, Thank you. Jordan will run around and do it. Just make your questions um, as succinct. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, the new Congress has pledged to slash State Department and foreign aid budgets, at least in the House. Uh, besides just arguing the merits of these budgets, what's your strategy for, uh, you just said that this is going to take increased resources in the short term. How, how do you square that circle? Do you scale back other priorities? Do you look towards the supplemental? And as a quick preemptive follow-up, how do you, uh, why does this document not address the issue of state congressional relations? Uh, one of the reasons DOD is so successful is that it embeds inside Congress and there are uniforms everywhere. Uh, what does State Department plan to do to increase their relationship with the Hill to make some of these things into a reality? Thank you. Okay. Second question, it's easy to answer. We, we don't have the same resources as DOD to put the same numbers on the Hill, but I think Assistant Secretary Verma has been incredibly effective, and he is well aware of what needs to, to change, and he's already been changing that uh, on, the, H, uh, on the, the Hill side. So that was not part of our mandate, uh, so we didn't address it, but we've certainly been doing a lot. But the, the second thing to say is this is the basis for our be budget presentation. The uh, Representative Ross Leighton said, you know, we want you to figure out how you can work much more better, much better and much more efficiently. The Secretary's answer is we've spent 18 months doing that. And this is our document. It figures out how to streamline in all sorts of ways. It does not list specific cuts because those specific cuts will happen as budgets are presented and the things that f align with our priorities will be funded and those that don't align so well with these priorities will not. But it is overall a basis that says we've thought very hard about where we need to invest. We will ask for funds in specific targeted areas, and in other areas we will do more with what we've got. Last thing to say is there's probably 60 percent of this document that can be implemented without new resources, and that we will simply go ahead uh, and start doing right away. Elise Lavitt, CNN. Thanks, Anne Marie. Um, I, I was wondering maybe if we could apply this um, to some real world examples of the stuff about development and conflict prevention. Um, we see what's going on in the Arab world right now. Um, and a lot of it, the Secretary predicted the day, a day earlier what was going to happen in Tunisia when she made this um, famous speech in Doha about regimes sinking in the sand. Um, how do you use these type of you know development these are the issues that are going to be the drivers of the 21st century. So how do you work with these states that don't necessarily get it until it's too late um, to institute some of these you know, issues of food security, issues of poverty, issues of um, you know, economic development and reform um, before we see them affecting the security of the region? Because these countries are the, and the regimes that you have been relying on for mainstays of security in the region. So this becomes a national security issue for the United States now. Thank you. It does. So let's, let's think about this from the perspective of what's happening in Tunisia now and then uh, in other countries uh, where the situation is quite different. In Tunisia now, uh, if you project forward from, in terms of the vision the QDDR outlines, Today we have Assistant Secretary Feltman in Tunis talking to the government, uh, which is what we would always do. That is classic regional diplomacy or bilateral diplomacy. It's incredibly important. There's nothing about the QDDR that says that's less important, just says other things are equally important. Going forward, you would want Assistant Secretary Feltman to go to Tunis with a team of people who are specialized in rule of law, democratic elections, uh, food security, as you said, the whole set of issues that the new government is going to take on. 
wouldn't just be us. We would probably be going with, uh, with both people from the African Union, the European Union, and others. But we would effectively have the expertise and the manpower to be able to assist in what we are seeing increasingly. You've got us, in this case, you have a state that was an authoritarian state that is now going to transition uh, to uh, a, a democracy. In other cases, you've got a very fragile state. But in both cases, you're talking about building institutions, you're talking about supporting the new government uh, within the region uh, in technical terms, political terms. and we need to be thinking ahead and what we're talking about is building the capabilities to be able to offer that kind of support materially but also in terms of expertise. So if you think about Tunisia, that's, that's where we would be. As I've, I've said a couple of times, in other cases, as in Sudan, you want to be in there early. You can see the possible conflict on the horizon and you, you We've always, our diplomats have always engaged in trying to prevent conflict between states, but now we're really talking about working at a much more micro level on the ground, looking for where conflict flashpoints might break out, and looking again at the kinds of quasi-development, quasi-diplomatic, uh, quasi-conflict prevention uh, tools that you need. And we, we, would, we want to be really increasing our ability to do that. Dan Dombe. Um, I, I'll try not to hit anybody else. Um, can I ask a uh, slightly more simple-minded question of mm. Elie, uh, a version of Elise's question, but particularly on Egypt? Uh, yesterday, the Secretary talked about the importance of, to, said that the assessment of the administration was that Egypt was stable. She talked about how the Egyptian government was seeming to be reaching out to the, uh, to the people in words that looked pretty friendly to the Mubarak regime, to be honest. And the president talked about uh, everyone standing um, with Tunisia, but he didn't mention Egypt at all. In both cases, there were then subsequent releases by the State Department and the White House. I'm very confused as to what the uh, administration's message is on Egypt. It seems almost in these cases that there's a kind of retroactive freedom doctrine that uh, as long as people have risen up successfully, that it's endorsed. But until the, the success is delivered, there's a kind of mixed message. Can you clear up in my mind what the message is? No, I mean I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm really not at this point qualified to comment on the specifics of our policy toward Egypt. What I would say, though, is I don't think it's at all inconsistent with the the basic premise of the national security strategy, which says it's in U.S. interests to have respect for universal values. That means we we are strongly supportive uh, of the Tunisians uh, in the effort to achieve democracy. It also means we're not imposing our values. Uh, in con on countries around the world. So we are, we're working in very many specific ways, in development ways, in internet freedom ways. We've been very clear that we stand for the freedom to connect, uh, and we think that was actually quite important uh, in Tunisia, uh, but we're not imposing our values. Dan, and just what's the nuance? I mean, what's the difference from a Bush, how would you define the difference from a Bush freedom doctrine? I think I did. But Dan, I mean, just in response, just make this more casual. I, I, if the Bush administration were in place now, I can't, I, I'm pretty sure they would give a pretty similar response. I don't find it inconsistent at all, in fact, to think on one hand the United States has to have relations and uh, uh, places equities around the world with lots of regimes that are messy and don't look like ours. I mean, the notion that we're somehow in the streets with every, you know, sort of potential freedom movement, I, I think is, is would, would be, one, a mistaken foreign policy, but not to be disrespectful of the aspirations of where people want to take their country um, and how they do it. So holding back and allowing that to happen, I think is perfectly legitimate um, to, to, to straddle what, what looks like straddling those. Um, I think it would be an incredible forfeiture. I would be all over this administration uh, if they were, you know, calling for regime change tomorrow in Egypt. I think it would be a huge, huge mistake. Um, and, I, and I don't find, you know, that a disrespectful statement from people who want to have a different form of democracy in Egypt, or a real democracy in Egypt, frankly, so. And if uh, I, if I can yeah. just add there, because actually, Dan, you helped me, uh, I think there is a connection really with the QDDR. What I was saying is moving forward, we have to be engaging in relations with states and societies at the same time. That's not an easy thing to do. 
but it is definitely not one or the other. We do not sim support people without engaging with their governments. It's a world of states, and we have all sorts of, of interests that have to be advanced working with states. At the same time, and we've been very clear on this, as have many administrations, and this is a secular trend that goes back decades, we don't deal with governments regardless of the state of their people, of how they treat their people or their people's aspirations. We address both. We address both through development, we address both through conflict prevention, we address both through diplomacy. That has to be worked out in individual cases, but I think you can see with Tunisia, we are supporting the process. We're not supporting a particular government. It's hard to, I mean, we're obviously working with the government as it evolves. And I think, uh, as, as Steve says, that on the other hand, that doesn't mean we're not still working with governments in the region. All right, James. If you're not going to get a lot of new resources and you're going to be basically sort of sharing out of the <coughs> common pot with the Defense Department, I, I wonder if you don't need sort of the equivalent to like of, a, of a Goldwater Nickel situation where you start at least at the COCOM level and sort of, you know, the, the state and AID equivalents, actually having people sort of, you know, sort of cross-pollinating uh, at a staffing level to sort of become acculturated and accustomed to working together before, you know, the crisis breaks out. I should say for the video, it's James Joyner of the Atlantic Council. But right. Great question. I, it's a great question, and we have actually tried to – build something like that in from a much more modest perspective. But one of the very concrete recommendations we make is that we are telling uh, people at both state and aid that if they want to be promoted, they have to demonstrate knowledge of the interagency, time spent at another agency, uh, and an ability to work well across agencies. And in the USAID context, uh, the, the leadership has been very direct talking about uh, really needing to move away from an aid-centric model of development, that they must demonstrate that inclusive leadership, really an ability to bring others uh, around the table. That means that we are going to try to create more opportunities for State Department and USAID uh, personnel to spend time at other agencies, and absolutely DOD is one. It, there is a chicken and egg problem. We need more resources to do that. Now, we've gotten substantial new resources, and a third of those resources are going into the training float. In other words, the ability, if you're sending somebody for training or you're sending somebody to another agency to learn what they do, you have to have somebody filling their job. And this is how uh, the Defense Department can do this so effectively because they've got enough personnel to cover that. It's a longer-term process, and that is one where we will need more resources or we'll need to allocate our resources differently. But absolutely, you're not going to get to this interagency vision that we're laying out unless people really know much more about what other agencies do, but also know about the culture, right? There are different cultures in every agency, just as there are in the different services. My friend John Tolson here, he's at State. Are you rushing because you've heard Hillary Clinton say that, you know, to get promoted, you're going to have to rush to another agency? Are you rushing to get out of State right That's now? That's totally work? unfair. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But look at him. You can tell he's, you know, on the promotion track, right? So. <laughs> And, um, and then the, the expectations that we have of them, of their career tracks, and sort of how they move along in their various jobs. So as part of your plan, has it included any, um, any mention of, of changing the way that we manage our human resources at State Department? Absolutely. That, I mean, if you look at the, the document itself, it says you have to change the expectations of individual officers as they advance. It has to be built into the position descriptions and the standards for promotion. That's the first place to start. And not only on the interagency side, but on things like engaging beyond the state, advancing women in all of our diplomacy. Those things have to be built in at a micro level. And when I say we shouldn't be leading the implementation, that has to be human resources. And that, but w the, the blueprint is clear. 
it's up to now Deputy Secretary Nides, uh, Director General Powell, uh, to oversee what that really means. But there's no question that this will not work unless it is built into the incentives that affect every Foreign Service officer uh, at a lower level. It also, frankly, helps if, you, if Foreign Service officers want to do what's in the QDDR for them to be able to say it's in the QDDR. Kay King with the Council on Foreign Relations and then Samir. Um, I just wanted to ask you in regard to the, the notion of promoting an, a more interagency whole of government approach, both in terms of personnel and resources, and given resource constraints, what do you think of the idea of um, putting forward an integrated national security budget? Um, n not only what do you think of it, but do you think it's at all feasible and in um, and, and kind of what kind of time frame? Thanks. Uh, we do think it's feasible. At the very end of the QDDR, we call for an integrated national security budget process uh, under the leadership of the White House, and we do actually expect that to begin uh, with the White House pulling together not just state and aid and DOD, but also Department of Homeland Security, parts of justice. There are a number of agencies that would qualify. Uh, so I do expect a lot of work uh, in that area over the next two years. It obviously requires work with Congress as well, with the congressional committees. But ultimately, if we're talking about a broader conception of national security, as we are when we talk about development, conflict prevention, we're talking about foreign policy, national security uh, interests, then we have to think about that in terms of how we develop the budget and how we present the budget uh, to Congress. Getting there is going to take some doing, but we absolutely Is, is, is Homeland Security behaving? I mean, when I talk to people who work <laughs> in any international bureau agency across lines, all of them have horror stories about DHS getting in their way, stopping what they're doing, and acting like the 900-pound gorilla that can do what, it's want, do what it wants in, without regard to other agencies or bureaus. And it was particularly during, particularly after 9-11, or after the creation of DHS, you had cases where Sandia National Weapons Laboratory, for instance, there's a lot of stakes in them knowing the smart, dangerous plutonium managers all around the world, but you couldn't get the Chinese in. You couldn't get others in. And, and, and the Department of Homeland Security was just uh, arrogant and indignant about its rules and whatnot, and, and no one else could really circumvent that. So it's one thing to sort of talk about everyone playing nicely, uh, but the rules are, I mean, the realities are that, that sometimes they, so I guess in a friendly way, uh, is DHS... Um, playing nicely, or is it, or is it uh, continuing to be, um, is it being a group player in this, or does it continue to create problems? So I, th I think we've made a lot of progress, and I, I do think they're being a group player, but part of government is contending interests. That's mm -hmm. what I always tell my students. If yeah. you want to go to be an advocate, go to an NGO. If you want to be <laughs> in government, you are going to have to actually reconcile the very legitimate interests of DHS saying, we make one mistake, and, you know, thousands worse, people could die, and are saying, we need to know this information, or you have just alienated a country that, is, it, that we're actually cultivating long term, we need to actually uh, change attitudes toward the United States, and this is not helping. But those are legitimate competing interests. And part of the reason to have an integrated national security budget, and that would assume integrated national security planning. And part of what we're doing is building the planning apparatus to be part of that would be to be making those trade-offs together, as opposed to their deciding their priorities, our deciding ours, and then absolutely they clash, and we do work it out. But it's not optimal, I think, in terms of how you'd want to have an integrated approach. Great, Samir Lalwani, and then Josh Marshall. Thank you, Professor Slaughter. Um, I, there's a question about the broader strategy. I know I'm back in the university world. <laughs> Yeah, if you're overly deferential to people here, Samir, you're not going to be invited back. No, no, back, it's the professor. So. I know that I'm back. I'm going I know, back. but he's still, he's still pretending to be a student. And, and time so to grow up. Maybe I'll uh, All right. pose a little tougher yeah. question. Um, okay. It's a question about the broader strategy Fake of conflict respect. prevention. Um, I'm sorry, it's a question about the... Of, of conflict prevention. Hmm. There seems to be a fundamental tension, uh, which I wonder if you can square for me. Like, the idea of uh, deploying civilians for human security, for development, and for conflict prevention... Uh, is, is most needed in dangerous and contested zones. But by doing so, uh, it requires um, some sort of private security, U.S. military backing, or making deals with local warlords. But this tends to really rankle the local population, trigger nationalist backlashes. So at, at some level, it seems it's always going to lead to militarization. What's our, what's our way out of this vicious circle? Good question. There are a couple different answers. One is we actually do call on the QDDR for a task force to reevaluate our risk management posture because 
it is a very complicated calculation between keeping our people safe and allowing them to do exactly what we're asking them to do in often dangerous circumstances. And the Foreign Service is not a stranger to, to danger. Uh, they have, you know, we've had many people uh, give their lives. Many others can tell you that they've been in many situations that are extremely dangerous. We, ha we looked at this, particularly on the USAID side uh, and often in our own embassies, we, there, there's a real tension and what we've committed to do is take a, a good hard look at this with diplomatic security and with the other people that need to be around the table. And then of course we have to go to Congress because this is not just up to us. But that's, that's one answer uh, that we may need to adjust uh, our rules with respect to how people uh, can operate. A second answer is that in, in some cases, and this is something I haven't talked as much about, this is an opportunity for partnerships with NGOs and even uh, and others who can do things that we can't do uh, sometimes better. And on the U.S. aid side, there's a tremendous shift toward developing local capacity, working with in-country in implementers rather than uh, U.S. Or, or international implementers. Uh, and if you, I strongly urge you to read Raj, Raj Shah's speech uh, last Thursday. It's one of the most powerful speeches I've read in a long time. And it, it pulls no punches uh, in terms of what you really need to build capabilities in country. Uh, so that's a, a second uh, way of acting. But the third thing is honestly, and this is where you really think about conflict prevention, it's going in much earlier. Right? We can see a lot of these crises on the horizon. We don't, and, and inevitably, you know, you deal with what comes down the pike, but if you have a bureau that is focused on looking ahead and looking at where this country really looks quite fragile in this area, what do we need to do? You, the, the point is that you get there before things get too dangerous to operate. Because I agree, in the current circumstances, once you have the kinds of conflicts raging, no, then the military obviously uh, has to be with you or some other kind of security. But if you can go in when the situation's still stable but fragile, then it looks quite different. Josh? Um, let me go back to the, the posture of, of provocation from the, from the beginning. And the one thing I, I, I thought about, you know, if you, if you look at the many decades process of the growth, maybe hyper growth of, of, of the Pentagon and the withering of the State Department and, and all that goes um, with that in terms of um, the, uh, the approach that the government takes towards, towards all sorts of uh, national security and, and foreign relations uh, issues. When I listened to your presentation, it occurred to me that the subtext was that rather that, that, that the DOD is sort of so big now that this can't, in, in all its, you know, in all different dimensions, that that can't be turned back in any um, major way, but you're sort of, to use a, a, a different jargon, sort of optimizing within that, within that context. Is that, is that a fair, is that a fair read? Did I really agree to come here? <laughs> no, I don't think it's a fair read. I, I think on the one hand, we're saying we need a, an equilib more of an equilibration of resources. When you talk about leading through civilian power, when you listen to Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton calling for more resources uh, on the civilian side, we are saying we need to increase. Uh, we are not calling for the decrease of the military budget, but we are calling for our increase. At the same time, I think the military is seeing a, that they are severely overstretched. That this is not a way to, to develop the, and maintain the kind of military they need to maintain. So they're looking uh, at their own budgets going forward and where they want to put their priorities. Uh, they're also themselves seeing they want to invest much more in prevention and what they call building partnership capacity, if you look at the QDR. So as they're seeing their budget evolve and, and uh, under the same kinds of constraints we're, we're all under. And we're seeing ours, uh, we think, rise, in, particularly in these areas where we need to invest. I think we are calling for, for an equilibration. At the same time, and particularly right now, it would be crazy to wait until that you know, future day. You have to accept where we are now, and that does mean that where DOD has many more resources than we do, then we find ways to work with them 
that are really equal across the board. I mean, the pool funding arrangements have to be very carefully structured precisely because of the difference in personnel resources between uh, DOD and state and USA that, so that it's really an equal conversation around the table. So it's really an equal decision as to how you spend those resources. So I would say it's both. We're going to have to start clustering because there, there are a lot of great questions and we're, uh, we just want to be cognizant right. of time. Um, I also want to say just with regard to this question that I, you know, in at least my case, you know, I do think that this is about rebalancing. It's not about just rebalancing role. I mean, we talk about rebalancing trade with China or economic. It's just like rebalancing the foreign relations and national security budgets. And, and when you look at what I was thinking last night when we were looking at $78 billion cut uh, in the DOD, which I still consider to be a rounding error, uh, is nonetheless – two and a half times the size of the State Department's budget. And so, I mean, that's to say the State Department's entire budget is less than a rounding error. Uh, and it's something to think about when you look at these. And I'm not shy at all thinking there's been too much of an increase uh, in, in one side of that portfolio. Um, so I want to go to Matt Iglesias, and we'll come up to Michelle in a minute. But, but uh, Matt, Will Gartshore, Alan Platt, and Arnold, mm. And then we'll come keep right. going around, okay? So... Do, do you worry ever that you might be fighting the last war here, that we've spent the past 20 years very preoccupied with these questions of, of development and internal state conflict, but that by the time this four-year cycle is over, mm -hmm. we're back into a world of where great power relationships and the growth of China and India mean that the sort of things that you're moving away from are gaining a, a renewed relevance? Interesting question. So that's Matt. Let's uh, run to Will Gartshore. Thanks. Um, I'm with World Wildlife Fund, and it was great to hear you mention um, environmental issues a couple of times. Um, just curious, as from our perspective, the natural resource issues and conservation even is going to be really tied to sustainable growth in the developing world and even conflict and instability. Um, do you see the QDDR, the reorganization that's going on, no, uh, point four that you mentioned, as a way to elevate those issues and integrate them more into development going forward? Great. Thank you. Alan Platt? In 2007, 2008, I was part of a study group uh, that looked at whether USAID should be independent or not. And there was a lot of support for this in the group. There's a lot of support for it in NGOs. Howard Berman, among others, has been strong on this issue. Uh, when Obama came, there was hope when Obama came in, and I know that during the transition there was a lot of discussion about this. Uh, this was discarded, and now two years later, it's clear uh, that uh, that's not the direction you're going, and you would refer to the British DFIAD agency, which a lot of people think is a model for a development agency. And I'm looking at, at the report here, and you say, make USAID the lead agency for presidential initiatives on food security and global health. I'd be curious to know what thought you've given in the context of the six points that you made about having AID being more independent. Okay, Arnold? I'm very puzzled by the number of people in Kabul and also in Baghdad, a thousand people in each embassy, five ambassadors in Kabul. Is all this really necessary, or is it a reflection of some of the things you've been talking about? Great. Thank you. And uh, let's run over to Michelle Jamrisko. Run, run, run. <laughs> <laughs> you get a special thanks, Jordan. And Maurice Thank is over you. here, by the way. I forgot to introduce Maurice. Maurice McCullough is my yes. indispensable assistant. It's incredible. Michelle. I wanted to ask about resource allocation in China, especially considering the sensitivities with the military relationship. How does state take a lead on that role and address the civilian power and the conflict prevention aspects? And if you could address specifically the $40 million expansion of the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and the role that that plays in the broader context. How much? Ex what's, what's the expansion? $40 million. Expansion in, in uh, Beijing? Yes, of the $434 million embassy. And I want, I want to see if you could put that into context in the, uh, the broader resource allocation in China. And, and let me just take the last two, and then we're going to close it. Wendy Chamberlain, and then right down here at the end. Thank you, Wendy Chamberlain. I want to say how much I appreciate and support the QDDR uh, effort. It's wonderful. Have some, I'm from president of the Middle East Institute right now, but I've spent decades in the State Department and in USAID. And, and my question really um, relates to uh, the the good old days, or the or the old days, maybe the bad old days, where there was a model for whole of government, and that was the country team in the country, mm -hmm. headed by the ambassador, but uh, all agencies represent or many agencies represented working together. 
Uh, you uh, mentioned Tunisia and uh, Jeff Feltman going out, wonderful. But you said that uh, maybe the next time, the next fragile state, the next conflict, he would go out with a team from many of the agencies here. And I'm trying to uh, imagine being the ambassador uh, when there's a crisis uh, with a country team that's been working very well and has lots of relations, suddenly, uh, when we're the busiest, and a whole team of people come, turning uh, all of these very good agencies that have been working well and have their contacts, suddenly into tourist uh, agencies and having to educate the representative from their agencies that has shown up. Um, uh, and we can do that because actually that's what happens and has happened. But my question is, have we thought of, and I'm sure you have, what the appearance is to the host government? Uh, where suddenly they are in their crisis, like in Tunisia, and the U.S. rides in with a busload of people saying, here we are to assist. Uh, and isn't that a diplomatic message that we might want to avoid? And of course, Wendy was Ambassador Paxton. If we can just grab this last sure. comment question, and we'll give Anne Marie an opportunity to do a wind up tour de force, answer all questions in 10, ten minutes. minutes or so. Uh, Yes. Hi, Amanda Terkel from the Huffington Post. Uh, last night in his State of the Union address, President Obama said in the coming months he's going to be putting forward a proposal to consolidate and reorganize uh, the federal government. I was just wondering if you think that a lot of what's in the QDDR will be part of that proposal. Cool. That'll be a headline with Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> the world is yours. All right. Great questions. So to Matt. I absolutely don't think we're fighting the last war. I think the point is these are going to be the issues of the 21st century. Uh, and I, indeed, I think that as China, India, Brazil, other countries rise, uh, we're going to be in the situation, which is in the first, first time since the early 19th century, where the largest economies in the world are not the richest economies in the world. So when uh, we, you know, in, in our lifetime, the largest economies and the richest economies were the same. That was the OECD. The OECD uh, countries at the UN had rich country problems. Uh, and we focused on terrorism and other issues of security. And other countries in the UN focused on development issues. That's already changing, and it's going to continue to change. Because when China and India are giant economies with all the, the power that that entails, they're still going to have develop, they're still going to be developing countries. And those issues will be increasingly on the global agenda. That said, it is true that we've got multiple systems operating at once. This is a 21st century conception of how global politics play. You heard Secretary Clinton say last week in her China speech uh, that we're not playing 19th century balance of power politics. We are not looking at this in terms of who wins, who loses. We're looking at this in terms of how do we work together to solve global problems. However, there are many countries rising and many people within those countries who are still thinking very much in 19th century terms. And we have to remember that. Because it is, it is important in terms of the signals that we send. It's important in terms of understanding the full parameters of the world we're working in. So these systems operate together. But I am quite convinced that when you look at what populations around the world need and then governments need to serve them and to stay in power, these are the issues that are actually uh, highest on the agenda. Second point on environmental issues, absolutely. Uh, this is, again, a concept of bringing all the different perspectives together. I mean, that was where the Secretary started with smart power. In many cases, and in fact, we've talked about this, environmental issues, conservation, these are sources of jobs or they're sources of problems, or the, the, lack, of, the lack thereof are real sources of problems. I think what is true is that there's going to have to be better ways for the new Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights to be working with the environmental folks uh, who will now be under uh, the Undersecretary for Economics, uh, uh, Energy, and the Environment. But, uh, and that may well mean you know, separate offices working together. But overall, this allows much more room for those kinds of issues. AID independent or not? No, I'd written down Alan Platt, and I'm thinking, that's not a question. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, it depends on your perspective. No. <laughs> so, uh, actually, underneath, I'd said USAID independence. <laughs> you know, honestly, 
could anybody right now think that USAID would be better off at a time when people are calling for defunding it completely if Raj Shah were fighting only for the budget rather than Secretary Clinton? Could anybody possibly imagine that they would be in better shape to get the money that they need? That has been what we've said from the beginning. We're not Britain, we're the United States. In the United States, it is very important to understand how development and diplomacy feed into national security much more broadly defined. And that is exactly what Administrator Shah said last week. Uh, it is vital, he was pointing out, all the ways in which USAID is an investment in our security long term, an investment in prosperity, and a reflection of our values. We have said from the beginning we want a strong, independent, powerful USAID, but we want it as a pillar of foreign policy because that's the way we think it will be best supported. Honestly, I was just in Britain. I was just talking to the British Minister of Development and the new government in Britain, of course, is, is keeping DFID as an independent cabinet agency, but they're looking in many different ways as to how DFID's uh, investments work within their larger foreign policy framework. So I think there are variations on this theme, but I am very convinced that we have the right answer for a strong, powerful development agency uh, that can main, main, uh, remain that way. Okay, Dominic, when you put this in a cable, I want to make sure you remember the TPM roundtable uh, so that when WikiLeaks comes out, we will see that we were memorialized in uh, a British cable back. Uh, Arnold, uh, Arnold is, is the, si the thousand in Kabul, thousand in yes. uh, Baghdad. So, so this is a, it's a very good question. I'm not at all surprised. <laughs> the, uh, I would say, you know, in many ways we've been implementing as we were thinking and writing because we couldn't wait for the QDDR to come out and then put things uh, on the ground. And in many cases what we wrote was informed by what we're doing, but it was also informed by places where we need to, th we probably need to streamline what we're doing better. So putting, so let, me, let me back up, there's a part of the QDDR that talks about uh, an integrated country plan in every country and a development strategy is part of that. But there's also a part that says, in countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, where you have multiple streams of foreign assistance, you need an integrated foreign assistance strategy. Now that's what we've been doing in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, as you say, you've got different ambassadors. We have some different ideas about how you do that. We've been trying different approaches. Some have worked. Some probably could work better in terms of relations between the mission director and, and the other ambassadors. So what we've tried to do is take what we're, we're learning, adapt, uh, I do think some version of that model is right, but I wouldn't say that exactly how we've done it, where we learn, is exactly how we're going to do it in the future. China. China. Resource allocation. So I, I guess I'm a little puzzled by the question. I mean, part of what we've said, and here we're continuing what Secretary Rice said, is we're shifting resources to uh, rising powers in various ways. And that was pretty evident that uh, we need to be uh, represented globally in a more distributed way. So building up uh, our resources in China and our ability to operate in China is something, again, Secretary Rice started, we've continued. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, by that at all. One thing I will say is part of what we hope that embassy will do and what we've started is to engage the Chinese on development issues as well as uh, the various other issues we engage them on. Uh, in the first strategic and economic dialogue, we mentioned development uh, at the table. In the second one, we actually had Administrator Shah there in Beijing, and he talked to his counterparts. Going forward, we're going to be trying to work with them much more actively on what they do and what we do in the development arena. So that engagement is, to go back to Matt's question, not just that we need to engage with a very important power globally and regionally, but also we want to engage them on a lot of these issues. Um, Wendy's point, thank you very much for allowing me to clarify uh, a couple of things. So in the first place, absolutely, there are some great embassies around the world where the country team works very, very well, and a common refrain among ambassadors is, <laughs> the problem's not here, the problem is back in Washington. We work very well on an interagency basis. Uh, it, it's when you get back to Washington that you have uh, more, more difficulties. That is true, and where that's working, that's great. Uh, that's not always true, and there are also many ambassadors who 
say effectively, there are other agencies spending money in my country and I'm not even aware of what it is. Now, some of that is because they don't have somebody on the ground and other agencies can't have people on the ground in 180 countries. So in many cases, that's just a, a function of the size of the country team. And there, what you have to then do is have a planning process, both on the ground, but then back here in Washington that lets, that effectively aligns all the different programs within a country. So that's to say that there, there are specific places where it doesn't work so well and where we think we can, we can make uh, major improvements. The, uh, and, and the other thing I would say is country planning that is not just engaging the country team member, but again, people back here uh, in, in who are making budget decisions that that person on the ground is not empowered uh, to make or sometimes not in, engaged in. But I do agree, you know, in my answer uh, to Elise where I said, you know, we'd send in a team, what I was thinking at, about was actually people more in state uh, who were more versed in some of those issues. But you raised two important points. One, and we do say this very clearly in the QDDR, we want to be supporting the mission. And there, we have various different types of teams, some uh, that would actually augment the mission to allow them to do what they need to do more of in the field, others to provide very specific kinds of expertise that they would ask for. But we're well aware of the problem of, of kind of overwhelming them. But the second point, and this is a very important one, we are not talking about sending in lots of teams for conflict prevention willy-nilly. This The government has to ask. The government, we have to be working with the government where there's a government uh, to work with. And indeed, the entire development section is premised on country ownership, is really premised on having the government focus on what it wants to do, as we did in Pakistan on the floods, as we're doing in Haiti, as hard as it is in Haiti to get the government to take ownership and for us to support them rather than for us to come in and announce this is what you need to do. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to Before clarify that. Before you jump that. to Amanda's question, let me just piggyback one thing here, but I wanted to help you make news just as you're leaving government. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why not, why not, and this ambassador issue is interesting, why not uh, put a paragraph in the report or in your recommendations or in your statement Friday at your party, recommend that ambassadors, um, you know, come from Forest Service or come from other divisions of government, you know, in which you've said that there's so much international expertise and people there would certainly be uh, something they could aspire to and move away and make a definitive statement about how um, politically appointed high donor ambassadors don't necessarily work. I was going to say, I don't think that's true at all. Okay, you I think mean, the money ambassadors work? Well. I don't, okay, think, they're, I don't think they're money ambassadors, well, Steve. And <laughs> the funds are ambassadors. No, 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 no. But wait a minute. I was yeah. just going to say, next week, uh -huh. for the first time ever, the secretary is calling together, not for the first time ever, but it's very unusual, calling together a chief of mission conference from chiefs of mission all over the world. And the agenda wow. is the QDDR, right. and particularly ambassadors as CEOs of multi-agency missions, uh, which is part of the QDDR. Now there, it's very important to have actual CEOs, who are many of our career uh, non-career ambassadors, working with our career ambassadors, both because they know things about leading in a multi-agency context that is very important, but also because there are certain tools they don't have. They come in from a, from a, a you know, a business where they've controlled their budget and they've controlled their personnel and they find themselves in a very different situation. But that exchange mm. and, and the ability of non-career ambassadors to continually inject those kinds of ideas into the process, I think actually works very well. Good answer. Uh, okay, Amanda's question. Uh, remind oh, I, yeah, me. Sorry. I, yeah, she asked her question, but it was, can, can uh, as in Obama's speech last <coughs> night, President Obama's oh, yes. the Union speech, can his plans on cutting and, and, and reforming, do, do you fit into that or not? I think we absolutely do. Some of his, his speech was really focused more on uh, the, some of the economic agencies, but absolutely, uh, you know, we work this through the entire interagency, and it is part of our thinking that we can work much more effectively and much more collaboratively. So I, I absolutely think that fits in. I just want to say one final thing, or do you, are you going to propose to me no, that no, I, I say one I final? No, no, I think you've done brilliantly. The one final thing I'll say, because I didn't give it enough attention, in every part of this document, every part, you will see a tremendous emphasis on women, on elevating the role of women, the issues concerning the empowerment of women and girls, not just in development, which is very, uh, uh, 
well established that that's the best investment we can make is, is investing in women and girls as part of development, but is also part of our diplomacy uh, in our bilateral and multilateral diplomacy and as part of our conflict prevention and response. Having women engaged in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, having women around the table, half the population around the table and deciding what has to happen is an incredibly important part of how we see ourselves advancing our interests going forward. We've still got a good ways to go, but I, I do think looking back, uh, this will be a document that you'll also see really took on that issue and took it on squarely across the board. Thank you very much. Josh, you want to offer any closing thoughts? <coughs> Uh, no, I just uh, thank you for your time. I thought I was very enlightening. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Anne Marie for coming out. It's really, and there's, you know, this kind of snow slush is not fun to have uh, an event. We'll hang out a little bit. There's a lot of French toast left if anybody wants it. Um, we plan to keep these things going. We've got um, commitments, though not dates, from Ron Bloom at the Department of Treasury yeah. to come and talk to us. Ron is very interesting in th thinking about, you know, the, the manufacturing side. How do you make a, I guess it's beyond, how do you make a middle class oriented revitalization agenda somewhat like uh, the president talked about not last night real uh, and also Jim Steinberg another former blogger at America Broad now Deputy Secretary of State has also agreed to come in so we're going to keep these going and we'll hope you join us so Emery thank, thank you, you so much and, and uh, nobody pulled their punches and, and, and we can't wait till you're at Princeton and back to blogging so thank you thank you